Hello, my name is Andrew Malloy. I'm a PhD architecture student um, based in Belfast. Um, and the following is the presentation I gave to the Research Graduate School Conference in the Ulster Hall in Belfast on the 26th of February 2014. Um, in the presentation, I talk a little bit about my methodology. Uh, I, I, I cover the, the theory sort of quite quickly um, but move on to methodology and talking about sort of a, a literature review and then I outline what I hope to do with it. Um, so yes I, uh, I'll i just get started then. Um, I start off perhaps a little bit unconventionally um, with a poem. So, May your bulletproof knickers drop like rain and your church spires attain a higher state of grace. My lily of the valley, the time is at hand for me to ring your bells and uproot your cellulose stem. I want hardware, software and binoculars to trace your ways of taking the eyes from my head. And none of it worked. You've been coming to your head for too long. Aircraft prick the veins of your rainbow as they shoot you in soft focus to trace the tram lines of your cellulite skin. But with the grace of a diva on a crackling screen, you never stem to their cameras. You're forever getting out of hand. And once in school on a grease-proof page, we had to trace the busts and booms of your body. And I was ashamed to hand mine in because I lack what my dad called grace. And I wish I was the scent of a raindrop that's falling in your head, the keys to your handcuffs, the drug that could reconjugate your head. For Belfast, if you'd be a Hollywood film, then I'd be Grace Kelly on my way to Monaco to pluck the stem of a Maybell with its row of empty shells, its head of 100 blinded eyes. I would finger your trace in that other city's face and bite its free hand as it fed me, or tried to soothe the stinging of your rain. I decided to begin with that poem by Alan Gillis because it succinctly encapsulates in those four short stanzas a struggle I've been having for most of my adult life, issues I have directed my PhD research toward and will, I'm sure, dominate the majority of my thought for the foreseeable future. This is the struggle to quantify and understand my home city of Belfast. As my home, it's an easy place to love. From it has sprung everything I hold dear. It has given me values, idealism, hopes and dreams while at the same time it smashes and distorts them, frustrates and disappoints. As my home, it's an easy place to hate. It was these feelings, along with the general feeling of jadedness and despondency with the practice of architecture, that led to an interest in the human condition. Who are we? Why do we exist the way we do? Why do we relate to our environment the way we do? And how do we relate to others? I looked at Cartesian dualism, Heideggerian phenomenology, social constructionism, hermeneutics, semiotics and social neuroscience. Over time all these seemingly divergent fields began to point towards a singular theory which led inevitably to the examination of reflexive sociology. In reflexive sociology the difference between object and subject collapses. Our social relationships come to bear on the seemingly lifeless objects around us and in doing so we turn objects into things and spaces into places. A simple arrangement of atoms represents a treasured memory, a repressed guilt, a time we'd rather forget. An arrangement of objects becomes a bedroom, a cell or a honeymoon suite. An arrangement of materials becomes a home, an image of freedom or that of oppression. How can anyone hope to analyse something as complex as the city in objective terms? The route to urban understanding is not quantifiable, in objective terms at least. Why worry, you may ask? Well, I don't think I am overstating the case when I suggest that the belief that there can be such a thing as a totally objective set of facts relating to a city has been fairly disastrous for architects and planners, particularly in the modernist period. The utopian ideas of streets in the sky and garden city estates led to new plans from Mount Vernon, New Lodge, the Lower Shankill and Devis, which we see here. These areas were rife with the worst social problems at the time, and I'm not saying that modernism caused these problems, but seems to have created the perfect environments for their propagation. The mistake here is the belief that there was a socially objective foundation to urban conditions, a straight and predictable cause and effect, 
meaning that a solution in one context would be a solution in all contexts. But Belfast is not the south of France, and nor is it New Jersey. How then can it be quantified? What is the route to a deeper reading of Belfast's urban condition? It must surely be through the examination of the individual reflexivity of those who have shaped it, and not only that, but an intense analysis of my own reflexivity as a researcher towards my home city, and how that changes or fails to, as may be the case, as I strive for this deeper reading. My proposed methodology, therefore, is to create a new map of Belfast, a map of ideas of Belfast, conceptions of Belfast which have shaped the city to varying degrees. A map, simply put, is a representation of space. We often think of a map as a piece of paper with an isomorphic line drawing of a given territory. Cartography appears to be intrinsically linked to the medium of representation. It is my belief that, in this case at least, the medium is not the message. Traditional paper maps, or even those more complex ones on our smartphones, are not the ideal medium for the type of map I am proposing. It is my assertion that the most fitting medium for this is film. Film and the city have been intertwined since the invention of the medium in the late 19th century. Early experiments in cinema such as those of the Lumiere brothers were often single shot, single concept films in an urban setting reveling in the novelty of a new and unfathomable medium. They brought images of distant and unimaginable places to a previously parochial audience and played with recognisable phenomena in order to provoke visceral reflexive reactions in their audience as demonstrated by the now mythical reports of people fleeing the cinema during this film, the arrival of a train at La Ciota. The idea of the City Symphony emerged as a concept in 1928 with Walter Ruppmann's Berlin Symphony of a Great City. Whilst no doubt inspired by the Lumiere's early single-shot experiments, Berlin collages and layers urban images, and whilst devoid of a conventional storyline, there is a narrative thread beginning with a train ride from the city's outskirts through industrial suburbs and into the inner city. We are presented with the waxing and waning of daily activities, starting at dawn and ending at sunset. The film slows down and speeds up in relation to the time of day and occasionally reaches a crescendo using a variety of effects including Walter Ruttman's painting with light technique which we saw at the beginning of this clip. The comparison of the direction of film and the conducting of a musical score as suggested by the title is compelling and the occasional wry observations and juxtaposition of imagery is evidence of a certain self-consciousness developing in the medium. Vertov's 1929 film Man with a Movie Camera displayed even more self-awareness. The framing device for the film is a cinema, beginning with the crowd entering and taking their seats and waiting in anticipation. The eponymous Man with a Movie Camera is the subject of the story, following him documenting elements of city life and in doing so occupying urban space in unique and inventive ways. There is an array of startling imagery, beginning with the opening shot of the movie camera being mounted on top of a giant camera, which we just saw, and a similar but equally evocative shot, which we see here, of a monumentally sized filmmaker towering over the city as he sets up his camera. We see our man on the back of speeding trucks, lying across the tracks as the locomotive approaches, climbing the ironwork supports of suspension bridges, riding motorcycles one-handed, all while cranking the handle of his cumbersome camera. A particularly poignant sequence shows still images becoming animated as the film negative is examined in the cutting room and the pace of the film slowly builds. This idea reaches its delightfully absurdist zenith as the camera itself becomes animate in this dazzling stop motion sequence. Man with the movie camera displays an unprecedented amount of self-consciousness and reflexive awareness for such an early stage in the medium. We'll now move forward roughly 80 years to some more uh, contemporary city symphonies. Terence Davies' 2008 film of Time in the City is a poetic biography of the filmmaker, making use of stock historical footage of his home city of Liverpool. The film very much borrows from the classical city symphonies, beginning with a velvet curtain slowly opening to reveal a screen and ending with a transcendent fireworks display providing a backdrop to the city. One cannot help but think of the opening of Man with a Movie Camera and the closing of Berlin, respectively. What follows is similar to the classical city symphonies, but with one key difference. Davies' poignant, sometimes anecdotal, occasionally dryly humorous and often achingly poetic narration. 
This draws attention to a specific, if meandering, if meandering narrative structure absent from the city symphonies of old, one which leads the viewer around the Liverpool of Davies' formative years as both he and the city struggle with the crises of identity invoked by the contemporary human and urban condition. The film is unashamedly reflective, speaking of the director's contradicting emotions relating to his place and time of birth as the flickering archival images of working class slums play across the screen, juxtaposed by overwrought choral music and contemporaneous pop. From the film's opening, that is the land of lost content, the happy highways where I went and cannot come again. We love the place we hate, then hate the place we love. We leave the place we love, then spend a lifetime trying to regain it. And from its closing, I said to my soul, be still and accept this, my chanson de more for all that has passed. But where, oh where are you, the Liverpool I knew and loved? Where have you gone without me? And now I'm an alien in my own land. What emerges is the pain inherent in the acquiescence demanded of urban citizens to the uncompromising and sweeping changes imposed by modernism. A compliant surrender to a progressive ideology entirely at odds with the strict power structures already in place under the guise of religion, state and local tradition. We resent the prescribed changes whilst also railing against our traditions because both appear so inhuman, irrelevant, not part of our own interpretations or articulations. Yet with the hindsight of time and the physical archive of the city's urban condition, one can appreciate how these tensions have created the individual capable of this contradicting reflection, even if it is coloured by a mixture of resentment, remorse and pangs of painful nostalgic happiness. Tom Anderson's epic documentary, Los Angeles Plays Itself, feels as indulgent and sprawling as the city in question. Over the course of three hours of clips from over 200 films, Anderson examine how, examines how the city of Los Angeles has been represented by its largest export, the movies. Anderson gets his apologies out of the way at the start, suggesting that any form of urban criticism based on the cinema is unfair because... The city is big, the image is small, movies are vertical, the city is horizontal, but, Anderson reasons, movies have some advantages over us. They can fly through the air, we must travel by land, they exist in space, we live and die in time, so why should I be generous? What follows is an unrelenting and unapologetically biased dissection of the way Los Angeles has been treated by its most celebrated industry. Anderson describes his film as a city symphony in reverse, a suggestion which deserves more thought, where the classical city symphonies direct the gaze of the viewer at particular urban phenomena in a specific sequence which has a bearing on their interpretation, leading them in theory to a particular articulation. Los Angeles plays itself draws attention to articulations and interpretations which are hinted at within existing films. In this way, Anderson begins to dismantle the mythical Los Angeles, a city which many moviegoers may claim to know whether they have physically been there or not. Of course, all that is known are specific articulations of specific sets of phenomena, and while matters of knowing and truth become arbitrary in such situations, it's easy to identify with the filmmaker's frustrations. To return to the metaphor of the symphony, the documentary is akin to hearing each member of the orchestra playing their part solo, or hearing early versions of classic songs. The magic is dispersed, and the monumentality of genius is revealed to be a distinctly fallible process. While Los Angeles plays itself displays deep feelings of nostalgia, it is not useless or reactionary, but rather a militant nostalgia, in the words of Anderson himself, change the past, it needs it. So what do I hope to do with this? Well, at the moment I am making a film myself, one which examines my own attitudes to the city through the prismatic effect of trying to look at it through the eyes of others. I have identified three individuals who have had a profound effect on the city. It's been my, an assumption of mine for a while now, which I'm starting to challenge, that it was a combination of the troubles and modernism that ruined the city. So as a starting point, I'll examine the attitudes of a uh, planner, Robert Matthew, whose 1960s master plan defines the city to this day. And then move further back in time to Sir Alfred Brumwell Thomas, architect Belfast City Hall, 
who had proposed a series of small yet ambitious uh, urban changes to the centre of Belfast which were never realised. This, it is hoped, will expose the motivations and ambitions inherent in the Victorian zeitgeist as they transform Belfast from a parochial town into a city of the empire. Lastly, I will examine the work of Sir Charles Brett, a remarkable individual who championed the cause of conservationism in Ulster, established the Ulster Architectural Heritage Society and was also intimately involved with the foundation of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. With Sir Charles Brett, we see the intimate connection between the built environment and the vital and increasingly pertinent social issue of identity. The film will document not just the work of these three pivotal individuals, but will also chart my own changing reflexivity toward my place of birth. I have discovered over the course of my research that the city is not in a ruinous state, it is not some dead or dying entity, in fact the city is not an entity at all. The city is, much like the mind, the human condition and social relations, a constantly moving process. At some stage we need to examine the metaphors we use and abandon them if they have been stretched too far. Thank you very much.